that. And I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, I did ask one parent, um, how are you enjoying class? She said, um, I was in BC Calculus. At least I think that's what it was. Um, and some of you have probably had that experience. Uh, but look, we, we, we try to create a day that you get to see the school in action. Um, you get to meet teachers, visit classes, go to performances, watch games, and so on. And uh, obviously part of it is also me speaking. And I take this very seriously. Uh, I think that you, as, as partners in this enterprise, deserve to hear my thinking on, on subjects. And uh, I really value it. And I, I feel privileged to be able to speak to you. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, organizational culture. And I guess I t called this, I entitled this Two First Days in the Work of TAF Faculty. And when I actually reread my comments this morning, I got up early. I realized, you know what, I want to dedicate it to the, I want to dedicate this talk to the TAF faculty, to those in the past and those with whom I work today, these colleagues who inspire and humble me every day. And so that's who this talk is, is really dedicated to do. And I want to talk about organizational culture, and I'll, I'll do it by talking about a book and, and looking at two first days, two cup, a couple of moments in our history, which I think say a lot about our culture. I'm interested in the topic. I think you should be as well, because a strong organizational culture will have a lot to do with the work we do and with our very reason for being here, which is to teach the whole student. You can't do that well without a really strong culture. And I think the organizational culture of this school, if you trace the roots back doggedly, really go back to the founding of the school in 1890. And like most great Genesis stories, uh, Horace Taft's first day in that house that was loaned to him in Pella Manor, New York, is a story with humble origins. The handful of students enrolled came by train and carriage, and Taft recounts in his memoirs how the furniture arrived by horse-drawn trucks that traveled through the night. He wrote, the furniture arrived at the same moment as the, the boys and their parents did. And I put both boys and parents to work on the porch, opening boxes. Carpenters were upstairs, putting up the beds. It was a most comical beginning of the school. And even the homeowner, the house owner, was a man named Robert Black, pitched in, greeting families. And by the way, if you're in the choral room later today uh, to hear a performance, it was his wife, uh, Mary Grace Witherby, who actually suggested and made the offer of the house. Her portrait stands now, or hangs up over the fireplace, Without her, there is no school. And Taft wrote in his memoir, Mr. Black said, Horace, you've got to have a bed 30 feet wide. Every mother is expecting you to tuck the boys in. And indeed, the place was so small that my long arm could almost reach any of them. You'll recall that Horace Taft was six foot five. That night, the faculty, and that is he, a Mr. Whitlock and a Miss Coles, and 14 boys sat down for that first sit-down dinner. Now, everything we are today, and I've made this comment before, but everything we are today is in that scene, if you will. Eager students, an intimate campus, a caring faculty, and a clear mission. And I wish I could say that when I read his work, that he, I found that he had worked strategically with the faculty to shape organizational culture. I can find nothing like that in his writings. I've never even seen that phrase that's so familiar to us today. But in some clear ways, I think that's what he was working towards, and we still are today. Here's what I see on that first day, and I see this by reading letters in his memoirs. Taft was willing to be very humble in his thinking about the work of faculty. In his early days, he wrote to his friend and, and headmaster Sherman Thatcher. He wrote this, I keep wishing for more strength and more sense and more everything. I make so many blunders and fall short of a very moderate ideal in so many ways, I often wonder what I was meant for. I think I know that feeling. There's a vulnerability in him here, something rare, it's something compelling, and that I assume began to mark the faculty and the school's culture. Second, he imparted in the faculty a sense of purpose, a clear vision he had of the school. Here's how he put it. He wrote years later, I suppose that nothing pleased me so much as my plan for a school on the idea that I might be a lay preacher, that association with boys would give me opportunity for influencing their ideas and ideals. And I found close association not only agreeable but often inspiring, for I began to think I was achieving some results that had nothing to do with the marking book or college examinations. 
Now, to be clear, this is the thinking of a young and untested head, but notice the absolute clarity of the mission there, of what he speaks. This school will influence the ideas and ideals. That sounds a lot like the education of the whole student. And then it would strive for something larger than just grades and colleges and acceptances. So I believe that began to shape everything. And then third, I think he saw school as family. He continually used the collective personal pronoun we as opposed to I. They were in it together. Of that first day, he wrote, we were in for a long, hard fight. We lacked nearly everything. They lived under one roof. They broke bread three times a day, called out good night to each other. If you worked at Taft, you belonged. And what struck me, now I come to the book, what struck me as I tried to understand those early days was how much his approach actually aligned with what I would argue is best thinking about institutional culture. And it aligns with the work of a book uh, titled Culture Code, The Secrets of Highly Successful Groups by a guy named Dan Coyle. Uh, it came out only about a year and a half ago. Anyone interested in institutional culture in whatever way, I would strongly recommend it. It is a book about how highly effective organizations have unique culture, and that of course got me thinking about culture here how we worked on it in the old days, in the past, and how we do it today, and how critical it is to teach your children well. Here's what he did. Coyle spent about four years visiting and researching really successful groups, asking what do they have in common? And the research was tremendously broad. You cannot imagine a more diverse group of organizations. He looked at Navy SEALs, an NBA team, inner city charter school, a comedy troupe, a top New York City restaurant, a large pharmaceutical, you get the idea. And what he discovered is that it was culture that set them apart. Nothing else even came close. He wrote this of group culture. It is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. We sense its present inside successful businesses, championship teams, thriving families. And we tend to think about it as a group trait, like DNA, somehow predetermined. And in this way of thinking, culture is a, pos is a possession determined by fate, some groups have, groups have the gift of culture and some don't. But thinking that good culture is either uh, is one of those either you have it or you don't is wrong. He says culture is hard work and any organization can shape it. And I quote him, he says, well, successful culture can look and feel like magic. In truth, it's not. Culture is a set of living relationships working towards a shared goal. Culture is not something you are. It's something you do. And I think Horace Taft was doing culture even then, and we still are today. He argues that in these very different organizations, culture was marked by three things. Safety and belonging, shared vulnerability, and common purpose. Every organization had those three elements in culture. And if it sounds a little bit like what I described in Horace Taft's opening days, and maybe a little bit of what you saw today, it's because it does. Here's what he said first, that sense of belonging. He kept finding evidence that in all these organizations, members felt that they belonged and that this sense of belonging was really powerful. He writes, when you ask people inside highly successful groups to describe their relationships with one another, they tend to choose the same word. It's not friends or team or tribe or any other plausible term. The word they use is family. And Coyle found this repeatedly. He found it with elite warriors and Navy SEALs. He found it with the uh, members of the KIPP schools, the charter schools. He found it with creative designers at IDEO. He found this everywhere. And by the way, he also found something, and that it won't surprise you, is that successful organizations, they even had family-type identifiers, names. Pixar's folks call themselves Pixarians, and they're Googlers and Zaponians. He might have added their Tafties. So in, in these successful groups, everybody felt safety and belonging. It was not to say they didn't have debate or disagreement, quite the reverse, but the more he looked, the more he saw a distinct pattern of interaction, a kind of catalog of behaviors that both reflected and created social connections and meant the organization felt like family. Here's what he saw, and any of you who are involved in organizations, ask yourself if your organizations have this catalog. Close physical proximity, often in small circles. Organizations like this have people together in close places. Profuse amounts of eye contact. Everyone's looking at each other. They're locked in. Interestingly, physical touch, handshakes, high fives, touches on the shoulder, on the arm. Hugs, 
Lots of short exchanges, few long speeches. Humor. Organizations tended to have a sense of humor. People laughed a lot. Interestingly, small courtesies. Thank you. Can I hold the door? Can I pass this to you? The chemistry felt, felt special at these places as if every single interaction signaled you are safe here and you belong. And these things did not just happen. They took work, they took strategy, they are practiced and they're repeated. Here is his best example, I think. When he went, uh, spent some time with the San Antonio Spurs, some of which some of you know, is one of the NBA's most successful franchises and teams and led by the great coach Greg Popovich. Coyle saw incredibly successful culture and he saw over and over again this rich mix of belonging signals. Coaches and players joked often. There, was lots of, there were a lot of touches on arms and shoulders. They heard phrases like, love you brother. They had lots of meetings and gatherings, sitting close, just a circle of folding chairs. They ate as many meals together as they had practices. Everything about that organization said, you are a member in a really special family. And indeed, when he interviewed players and said, can you tell me a time that you saw the most family cohesion? They all had the same answer. And they all referenced the same awful night, which was in June 2013, after a heartbreaking loss to Miami in the NBA Finals. And how that night, with the players fully uh, expecting, devastated, ex expecting and assuming that they would go back to their individual hotel rooms, Popovich looked and said, family. And he arrived at early at the very same restaurant that they had hoped to celebrate in. And he got there and he moved tables around, he put name cards out, he chose the wine, and then he gathered himself. And then when players and coaches and families and partners came in, he was there. There was a hug and a handshake. He walked among the tables with touches on the arm and the shoulder. There were jokes and there were tears. We are family, he was saying. When players were asked about him later, one of them said this. He was like the father of the bride at a wedding. Every one of them felt family. And I hope that if Coyle visited Taft, he would see similar interactions with faculty. We have lots of meetings. Dorm faculty, deans, academic chairs, coaches, counselors. And we try to signal to each other we're part of family. And they can be really serious. They can be high stakes. They can be complex. And we crowd in offices and sit around tables and gather in Lowry to talk about student performance and health, about best practices, about ways we can get better. We tell stories that remind us, as even as we have differences, we are a part of something larger together. This student's really challenging me. My aging mother's ill. My babysitter canceled. My class went badly. My advisee is struggling. My car needs a new transmission. Our colleague just died. There's some warm joking. There's rigorous debate, there's intense eye contact, there's gestures of empathy, there's lots of leaning in. It is hard work, and we struggle. We have differences, but we try to feel like we're family. It is a big part of the reason teachers can find the stamina and the support they do to teach your children. So here's the second thing. So the first was that sense of family. Second thing he observed in organizations, and to me it was surprising. It was a sense of shared vulnerability. I thought it was surprising because I would assume that at these really incredibly successful and often very competitive organizations, this would be the last thing anyone would want to express, but that's not what he found. Here's my favorite of his stories. In 1989, United Airlines Flight 232 left Denver for Chicago with 280 passengers. And a few hours into an otherwise quiet flight, one engine exploded, it severed the main hydraulic line which controlled all the wing flaps, the rudder, and the aileron. The pilots had no ability to control the plane. And they began to porpoise and wobble and dive and plummet. The National Traffic Safety Board calls events like this, quote, catastrophic failure. They are exceedingly rare. They are almost invariably fatal. The cockpit was a scene of chaos. And then sitting in first class was a man named Denny Fitch, who was a pilot trainer. He said to the stewardess he was willing to help. The captain sent word, send them up. Now it may not sound like much, but pilots are supposed to be in control and invulnerable, and not every one of them would have said, send them up. Fitch entered the cockpit, he saw the captain, officer, and engineer white knuckled, straining at the controls, alarms wailing, lights flashing, and what he said next was an invitation to be vulnerable, a message that said, it is safe to ask for help. These are the words he said, tell me what you want, 
and I will help you. Now, can you imagine 10 words more helpful Ed said at that moment of crisis? He was signaling to them, it is okay to be vulnerable. It is okay not to have answers. Let's solve this together. And the four men began to talk, ask questions, make suggestions, share problems, express confusion. And when we read the, tri the flight transcript, what is striking is how many times these very, very capable men signaled their vulnerability to each other. These are direct quotes from the transcript as that plane was plummeting and wobbling. Does anybody have any ideas? How do we get the landing gear down? I have no idea how to fix this. Can you help? Can we even turn left? Do you agree? And my favorite, directed to Fitch himself, listen to this language. Do you want this seat? Yes, do you mind? I don't mind. <laughs> I think you know what you're doing here. So with each signal, their trust deepened, their decision-making strengthened, and they began to find novel responses. And in Iowa, the plane did an emergency landing at twice the normal speed, tore off a wing, parts of the plane burst into flames. But 185 of those passengers survived, some of them walking off the plane into a nearby cornfield. And when the NTSB recreated the conditions with experienced flights, pilots in simulation exercises, they crashed 28 of 28 times. So what's going on here? Why is it possible that signaling your vulnerability actually strengthens an organizational culture? Here's why. Coyle writes that the most uh, effective organizations often seem to have an effective flow. In our best moments at Taft, I know what that feels like, a kind of seamless fluency. But he says, if you look closely, however, you'll notice something else. Sprinkled amid those moments of smoothness are moments that don't feel so beautiful. These moments are clunky and awkward, and they're full of hard questions. I know those moments. That's what was happening in the cockpit, what he would call a, a vulnerability loop, quote, a shared exchange of openness that is the basic building block of trust. And here's his key point. Normally, we think we build trust and then we leap. But research shows we have it backwards. Vulnerability doesn't come after trust. It precedes it. So there's a really powerful message here, I think. When you telegraph to fellow members of your organization, you have a role here and I need you. Here's another group you saw shared vulnerability with. And again, you might not expect it, Navy SEALs the most elite, tough warriors. But what they're really good at, maybe best at, is sharing their vulnerable moments when they conduct an after-action review. They conduct AARs. The exercise is exactly what you'd expect it to be. It is a tough, self-critical review of a fight. The stakes are obviously high. Mistakes mean soldiers die. And one SEAL put it this way. Rank is switched off. Humility is switched on. You are looking for the moment when people can say, I screwed up. These might be the four most important words a leader can say. Expressing vulnerability, I have mistakes, is not just how SEALs improve, it's how they trust. So I like to think that our own organization has some of those same qualities. It is hard work. This does not just happen. It has to be witnessed everywhere and including in my office. I see lots of clunky moments that reveal our vulnerability and also the trust. Faculty are perpetually saying versions of what the flight, those pilots on the flight or those Navy SEALs are saying. We are perpetually saying, I don't know if I have the answer. I need help. We often conduct our own versions of AARs after a particularly significant event. It could be an unplanned for student event. It'll be after this weekend itself. I ask that we review. If the event has gone well, we call it a biopsy. If it's gone badly, you guessed it. We call it an autopsy. Biopsies and autopsies are really open affairs. We ask things like, what do you wish had gone differently? Where did you feel it went wrong? What suggestions do you have for improvement? And faculty signal their vulnerability in countless other ways. If you sat in a, in a group of faculty tackling, tackling a tough problem, the senior admin team, student life offices, dorm heads, counselors and physicians, academic departments, you sat in on any group tackling a hard problem, you'd hear things like this. I've tried everything. I have no new ideas on how to help the student. I really need help understanding this issue. I thought I was listening, but the conversation still went badly. This course material is totally new for me. It's my fourth night of duty, and I am fried. And with each moment a teacher signals need, they are looping the trust 
So that act of vulnerability ultimately helps us serve students better. The last thing he saw in these organizations uh, that I mentioned, it won't surprise you, is that they all had a sense of common purpose, right? By the way, that it's obvious doesn't mean that it is easy. Coyle's case study in compass, uh, common purpose is one some of you may remember. Since 1948, the Johnson & Johnson Healthcare Company has been guided by a simple 311-word credo. It is a compelling, clear, and somber, if also decidedly unsexy statement of mission. And it begins with this. We believe our first responsibility is to doctors, nurses, and patients, to mothers and fathers, and all others who use our products. And it goes on for the another 300 words. The credo, and it is capitalized, this is a capital C, is prominently displayed in corporate headquarters. It's engraved in granite. If you went to the New Jersey offices, everybody knows it. Everybody knows the credo. Over the years, the company has conducted reviews, occasionally people asking, does it still serve? Is it accurate? Is it inspiring? And then in September 1982, some of you remember this, six people in Chicago died of cyanide poisoning after taking extra strength Tylenol. And panic ensued. As Coyle writes, in a few hours, Johnson & Johnson went from being a provider of medicine to being a provider of poison. Company executives met, a group of seven, you can imagine the pressure. There were no easy answers. There's no playbook. The FBI and FDA strongly encouraged that the com company limit any recall to just the Chicago area. The larger one, they said, would frighten the public. Stakeholders, of course, made the point, this will cost millions if we do something larger. But company president James Burke and his executive team decided to do something different, and you remember. They ordered a national recall of 31 million pills at a cost of over $100 million. And within six weeks, they had created new tamper-proof packaging that completely changed the industry. To this day, that Tylenol case is seen as the model of corporate crisis management. Why did they choose this advice against the advice, uh, choose this course against the advice of many, including the uh, lawyers and officials? You guessed it. When asked about the decision-making process, Burke said, the credo ran it. At good organizations, Coyle says, you tend to hear the same phrases, these groups devote a surprising amount of time to telling their own story, reminding each other precisely what they stand for, and then repeating it ad infinitum. And by the way, they are not embarrassed by the repetition. These are not cliches. The phrases read almost kind of Talmudic in their power. You'll find these phrases at all great organizations. The New Zealand All Blacks, which is the most famous rugby team in the world, they have their words. It's simple, leave the jersey in a better place. Everybody knows that phrase. If you go to a KIPP charter school, you're going to hear, work hard, be nice, and you will probably hear that 50 times a week. We have our versions. That's why you'll hear education, the whole student, a lot. You will hear it when you interview for a job. You'll hear it during the orientation. You're going to hear it at a January uh, department meeting. You will hear no nut sibi a lot. It's short for our motto, no nut sibi ministratur sedut ministret. I see a student finish a tour, pick up a napkin on the servery, uh, make an announcement for a cancer walk, I'm going to drop a no nude sibi on them. You see that phrase etched in stone and wood and glass. You'll hear, be nice, take risks, let's try to catch them doing something good. Look for teaching moments every hour and every corner. Take the business of the classroom really seriously. Put kids first. You will hear those kind of phrases over and over again. So that's the kind of organizational culture that we're trying to create. It's one of safety and belonging, shared vulnerability, common purpose. It is absolutely stuff we do, not something we are. I will be honest, as a faculty, we struggle. We fall short plenty of times. We know it's hard work. We know it'll never stop. And as parents, you've trusted your children to be educated by this faculty. And the education you saw today flows directly, cannot be separated from that organizational culture. So let's close, not with Horace Taft's first day on the job, but mine, which happened to be September 11th, 2001. I've thought of that day a thousand times, but nothing matters more to me than what I saw of the faculty and what I saw of school culture that day. For my colleagues now and then, I feel blessed. I was walking into Bingham that first morning on 9-11 to do a sound check before I gave my first school meeting when I heard the news of the first plane, when the school exited the auditorium, our lives had changed. And I could tell you what we did, emergency faculty meetings, special assembly back here, 
advisory gatherings, dorm meetings, and so on. But that's not really the point. The point is what I saw in our culture. Had Coyle visited that day, I think this is what he would have seen. He would have seen a faculty that signaled to each other in countless ways, we are family. We saw it in physical touch, hugs, holding hands, an arm on a shoulder. We saw it in grace over dinner and good nights bid in the dorm. We saw it in gestures of courtesy and kindness, a, a box of Kleenex quietly slid across a table, an office door cracked open, are you okay? Everything that day said you belong. We're a family in this. I hope he would have seen a faculty that shared their vulnerability in ways that built iron trust and remarkable strength. In one meeting, it was an experienced class dean blinking back tears who asked, how do we even begin to identify students we're most concerned about one day into a new school year? And someone said, let's pray first. And we did. And then everyone in the room began to offer answers. Another said, my two children just came home from school and are scared. And a colleague said, you need help. Be with them. I'll cover class. A dorm head said, does anybody have good ideas on how we handle 1030 lights tonight? Because I think that's going to be really hard for students, especially those who are away for the first night today. And suggestions came in, just like those pilots. And I think he would have seen a faculty that was united in common purpose, the whole student. I am not sure we even ever used that phrase that day. It was the one thing we didn't have to discuss. We didn't talk about it. Everybody, every teacher, no matter their age or experience, knew that they were tasked to serve the hearts and minds and souls of students. They got it. They didn't need to be told. I really mean this. I don't know that I ever used that phrase. But here's my coil story of the day, and I'll leave it with you as a glimpse of our organiza organizational culture, of the school culture, of faculty culture. And of all the things that we asked faculty do to, did to do that day, it was the one thing that we had not discussed that I remember most. And I would argue it's the Taft faculty writ large and in a single act, and it was this. Late that night of the 11th, and I found this only the next day when I was told, without being asked, without any coordination, burdened by their own anxieties and emptied out with their own exhaustion, there were teachers all over campus up at 2 and 3 in the morning, walking the dorms, quietly opening doors, peeking in rooms to make sure boys and girls were asleep. No one had asked them to do that. So as a faculty and as a school, we make mistakes. We have bad days. We find some challenges almost impossibly complex. But we work really hard at culture. And we can't separate that culture from the ways we try to teach your children. I'm sure Horace Taft carried with him images from his first day. I wonder what they were. Perhaps talking to some lonely boy away from home for the first time, or maybe he was grasping hands over grace, or maybe he was shutting out the lights and singing out good night to those 14 students in the next room. I don't know. But I do know that of the many things that I pulled from the rubble of memory that day, and which I carry with me today still like a talisman. It's the, images, the image of teachers walking silent dorms late at night looking in on sleeping students. And a few hours later, the bell rang and they went off to teach first period class. So, I thank you. I wanted to give you a glimpse of our culture and what we strive to do. I hope you witnessed a little piece of it today. I hope you have a wonderful day and I thank you for all you do for Taft. Thank you. <laughs>